So let's talk about COPD. So it actually has many names, and your maybe your mom and dad might know it more by emphysema. So all of these, this COPD is the more modern term and more increasingly widely used term for emphysema. So what happens? Well, here we have the normal lungs and the alveoli again, those little sacs. But now we have the alveoli, they're being destroyed. So you no longer get this nice little network. These alveoli start to become bigger and these sacs become looser. So now these bronchioles start to, or alveoli start to lose their shape. Actually, what do you notice about the lung? It kind of starts to lose its shape as well. So how does this relate to spirometry? Well, we have something called force vital capacity. So again, vital capacity is your tidal volume expiratory. So again, your IRV plus tidal volume plus ERV. Your force vital capacity. So what do you do? A big inhale and then do a force exhalation. But instead of just trying to blow out as much air as possible, you try to blow out as much air as possible, but also as fast as you can. So it's not just like a gradual exhale. You have to go. <sighs> so that's a forced exhalation. But you also have to do it as quickly as possible. So how does that look? So say we have just like, so they're taking their time during a forced breathing in this blue curve here. But if you're doing a forced uh, vital capacity, instead of taking your time during exhalation like we did in the blue curve, Notice that the sharp decrease is faster. So they have instead of this is a typical curve you see during a force vital capacity. So why do we call it, talk about that? Well, you also need to do that to measure something called FEV1 or your force expiratory volume in one second. So yeah, that sounds really scary. But what does that involve? So what's the FEV1? Well, you have to do that force vital capacity. So you do have as much time as you want to breathe in and fully inflate your lungs. But breathing out, again, has to be as fast as possible and push out as much air as possible as well. So FEV1, so again, big inhale and then exhale. But FEV1 is a snapshot after one second after that inhale. So it's always one second. So what do you do? You see how much air is moved out in that one second. And then FEV1, and then you have here, this is when they're able to force out the rest of the volume inside their um, expiratory reserve volume. So this is their force vital capacity. Is it one and the same? Well, again, notice that it took them longer than one second to force out all that air in their ERV. So force vital capacity, let's see, is this a repeat slide? Yeah. Okay, so FEV1, FEC ratio. So this is something we measure in spirometry, and also it gives an indicator of what type of lung disease a patient might have. So what do you notice? Well, all you're doing is comparing, hey, how big, it, how much volume did you have in the FEV1 compared to the maximum volume you have in that force vital capacity. So that's what we have here. So spirometry. So we have two broad categories, or actually not broad categories, because they can overlap, but two categories of lung diseases, obstructive lung diseases, so that means something blocking exhalation. So it might include things like asthma. So asthma, again, if those bronchi or bronchial start constricting and limiting and impeding your breathing, so that's going to block your airflow of air, right? Remember, just like blood vessels, as the vessel gets smaller, the flow decreases. If your bronchioles and bronchi start decreasing in diameter, what's that going to do to your breathing? It's going to restrict your breathing. So that's obstructing your airflow. That's asthma. And COPD also results in mucus and other things blocking your lungs as well and preventing exhalation. And even something like saying choking, that's actually a, like, say you're eating something too fast and instead of going down your esophagus, your food ends up in your trachea. Well, that's also obstructive lung disease because why? It's blocking exhalation. Cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis also results in things accumulating in your lung. So then restrictive lung diseases, Instead of something blocking your lungs, what happens here is that you have something preventing your lungs from fully inflating. 
So things like pulmonary fibrosis and COPD. So this is the funny thing. A disease can be both obstructive and restrictive. They do have different definitions for obstructive and restrictive, but it all depends. Is something blocking breathing or something restricting your, your lungs from fully inflating? So how does that relate to disease and spirometry? So let's see. So up, let's talk about obstructive lung diseases. So when you have obstructive lung disease, what happens? Well, here we have a normal curve. So here we have a regular FEC and FEV1. Now, during obstructive lung disease, what happens? So remember, during let's use an example like asthma. What happens during asthma? Again, your your bronchioles and bronchi are also constricting, thereby limiting the flow of air. So by limiting the flow, you're actually going to slow things down. So all the way back to algebra and calculus, what does the curve look like if things slow? Well, instead of being very steep, it's going to end up being flatter. And this is what we see during an obstructive lung disease. We actually see a flatter rate of pushing out the air. So does that affect the FEV1? Yeah, what you see is that at the one second snapshot right here, this person pushed out less air. Why? Again, if you have something blocking your breathing, it's going to slow the movement of air when you push out during an FEV1. So this is the obstructive FEV1 versus normal. Notice that the obstructive FEV1 is decreased. You still have the same vital capacity because you are talking about the same lungs, but now you're slowing the air flow. All right, so then let's talk about that FEV1, FEC ratio. What we see here is that when the obstructive FEV1 Normal FEV1 to FEC is not one and the same, but this ratio, this fraction, would end up smaller. Why? You have a smaller FEV1, still the same FEC, but compared to the normal, which has a greater value. So typically, when we see obstructive disease, this FEV1 value drops. Therefore, the ratio is below 0.8. All right, restrictive lung diseases, so lungs can't fully inflate. So if you've ever worn any of these, so this is Spanx or have you, I mean, I've never worn a corset, but supposedly, like, if you've worn a corset, this also restricts your breathing as well. So why? Because you can't inflate your lungs as much if you have something pushing it uh, against it. Or this is, I've only seen power lifters use this, but it's really funny because I, whenever I used to see the guys at Powerhouse Gym, they always have these really, really tight shirts that they use to help, uh, I guess, compress their muscles to lift those crazy huge weights. But it's really crazy too because those sh shirts are so tight that they actually need other guys to help pull it on and pull it off them. It's really great, but the thing about this is that it would also help to, so what do these do? These would restrict your breathing. So what does a restrictive lung disease look like? And I will answer your concerns, but I'm trying to get through this lecture in time. All right, so restrictive lung diseases. So what happens here? So here we have a normal curve. So here we have a normal FEC. And again, that FEV1 is a snapshot right after one second after inhale, fully inhaling. So what does a restrictive lung disease look like? Well, instead of fully inflating, it's actually going to impede. Why? Because it's like, say, oh wait, we can't do this with social distancing, but what I used to have people do is like, okay, I had someone, like it would be another partner thing, but they would stand up with their friend and their friend would have them do a bear hug. So if someone's giving you a really, really good hug and you can't, and can't get out of it, can you breathe as easily? Can you inflate your lungs as much? Not really, right? It's restricting your breathing. So, it's 10 minutes longer because I gotta get through this. <laughs> but if you want to leave, you can, you can leave, but I'm going to cover the rest of this. Yep, so again. So if you have classes to go to, by all means, go to it. But again, oh yeah, by the way, labs are all online. Alright, so then, 
when you have a restrictive lung disease, what happens? You have the, you can't inflate your lungs as fully. So what happens to the FEV1 FEC ratio? So no, it's kind of hard to see here at first, but let's you compare the ratios. So what do we have here? And yes, it is being recorded. Yeah, so restrictive FEV1, FEC, so normal FEV1, FEC. So what do we have here? Well, we have the opposite. Instead of the ratio being smaller, the restrictive FEV1, FEC ratio is actually greater than normal. So at first, that's kind of hard to understand, but think of it this way. Pretend your lung volumes and the air inside your lungs are like boxes. If you're moving house, is it easier to move out three boxes of goods or is it easier to move out ten boxes? It's easier to move out three boxes, right, at a faster rate. So this is what's happening with the restrictive lung disease. Or if you have less lung volume to work with, it's easier to push out that lung volume than when you have a greater lung volume. All right, so again, obstructive, and this will be up on the slides. Again, you do have COPD in both. All right, so we have emphysema, chronic obstructive lung disease, and then, so yeah, this is what we have here. So these are alveoli. Here we have normal, healthy lungs in the control, and here we have COPD and emphysema. So we have cigarette smoke. So the thing about cigarette smoke it, is that it contains a lot of chemicals that actually damage your pneumocytes. So all these pneumocytes here, they start dying off. And when they start dying off, these walls break down and these pockets get very big. Now, is this good? No, not really. So why? Because now instead of having all this surface area where you can have capillaries and blood vessels, now you have less surface area inside of your alveoli. And the thing about your alveoli, they're kind of like a net. So what happens if you start cutting holes in nets? Well, can the net really hold its shape or really hold on to its contents? Not really. So what happens during cigarette smoke? You have less elastic fibers, you have damaged alveoli, more collagen. So things get in, yeah, this really affects your lung volume. So smoking. Big cause of COPD. Why? It damages your pneumocytes. It damage causes fibrosis. It loses elasticity in your lungs. Age can cause it as well. So can genetics. But again, chronic bronchitis. But smoking again is the biggest cause of COPD. Why? It's killing all those pneumocytes right here. Alright, so I think that's it. So again, elastic fibers and alveoli. Yeah, so... Yeah, I know it's about vaping too, but oh my god, has, so a lot is still coming out on that. I probably would have a lecture on that in maybe in two years when they have more studies. I think COVID is a big priority right now. But okay, let's answer questions. YouTube, let's see. God, I hope YouTube works. I mean, it can't be that hard, I hope. <laughs> So, is damage to elastic fibers permanent? Yeah, so that's the thing about this elastic fibers. Is there is ability of fibroblasts to repair elastic fibers, but if you're smoking and chain smoking and damaging the alveoli, and yeah, your fibroblasts might not have enough time to really produce enough elastin to repair your but again, what happens when you stop smoking? Well, you actually see an increase in lung function. So the permanent damage, I mean, yeah, if you smoke long enough, yeah, you won't be able to recover. But when even within like a month after someone stops cigarette smoking, you see an increase in their lung capacity and their FEV1, FEC. So... Well, if you're a smoker, does that mean you're destined to get COPD? Well, it depends on how much you smoke, how much you... But compared to not smoking at all, yeah, you're... I mean, 
you're at increased risk of COPD, but it just depends on how much damage you do to your alveoli and the tissue surrounding your alveoli.